I know the lighting is like really weird with this whole situation, but I'm actually feeling motivated to film for once, so I'm sorry, but we're getting it done because if not, it's going to be another three months until my next video, so we're going to have to deal with the shitty lighting. It's your girl Jay and today I'm here with my January wrap-up for 2024. I read a total of 15 books and I split this wrap-up into two parts. So if you're interested in part one then check it out on my channel. But without further ado, let us get started. The first book that I have is Gone Tomorrow by Sarah Pekinen and I gave this a 4.5 out of 5 stars. Ruth Sterling and her daughter Catherine have been inseparable since Catherine was born. She is now 24, beginning her career as a nurse. She gets a career opportunity in Baltimore, but she turns it down when she realizes that her mother is showing signs of early onset dementia. As Catherine begins trying to look into her mother's past, she starts to discover some dark secrets that she has been hiding from her for all these years. This is told in a dual point of view between Catherine and her mother. Both are very unreliable narrators, which is one of my favorite tropes. It was really interesting to see both of their deceptions and lies unravel as the story progressed because it made it very hard to figure out which one of them to trust. Their relationship dynamic changed so much from the beginning to the end of the story and it was so interesting to see it unravel. I actually listened to this one on audiobook and I do think that the narrator did a good job with these two characters but I do wish that there was a bit of a vocal change to differentiate the two characters because it was a little bit confusing at times. The story is also told in alternating timelines between the past and the present. We get a lot from Ruth's past which was such a roller coaster. I was so invested in learning more about her backstory. The twists and turns were really well done. I didn't want to put this book down. I just wanted to know what was going to happen next. So I ended up giving it a 4.5 out of 5 star. Definitely recommend this one. The next book I have is The Second Death of Edie and Violet Bond, and this is by Amanda Glaze. I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. This takes place in 1885 when twins Violet and Edie join a spiritualist group after the death of their mother and their father threatening to throw them into an insane asylum. Violet has the ability to open the veil between life and death, and Edie is able to cross that veil. Mediums begin going missing and the girls realize that the dark spirit that killed their mother has crossed into the living realm. With the help of a nosy journalist, Edie discovers some dark secrets behind the missing mediums and it's kind of the story of that. First off, can we just, can we just look at this cover? I think it is gorgeous. I love it so much. This is definitely a slower paced book in the beginning, but it did pick up in tempo as the story progressed. I was so invested in these characters. I thought they were so interesting. The book is actually based off of two real life people. Edie is actually the author's real life grandmother, and she actually was a medium in the 19th century. Violet is her twin sister. I thought it was so cool. There's also a huge focus on women's rights in this time period, which I thought really enhanced the tension within the story. You can definitely tell that the author did a lot of research to write this story, which I really appreciated. I didn't mind the romance in this. I think that it progressed nicely. I don't think it felt too rushed or forced. It's also an enemies to lovers, which is one of my favorite tropes, so I was bound to enjoy it at least a little bit. The biggest complaint I probably do have for the book, though, is that there was so much focus on Edie and we didn't really get a lot from Violet, which would have been nice to have a balance of the two, but it was still a really fun book. I think that the conclusion was really well done. I liked where it ended off. Overall, I think that this was a lot of fun. I did really enjoy it. I think that it would be the perfect read for fall time, so maybe keep this one in mind for your spooky reads. The next book that I read is the statistical... I can't say this. <laughs> the next book that I read is The Statistical Probability of Falling in Love by Jennifer E. Smith, and I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars. This book follows Hadley, who misses the flight to England for her father's second wedding. She meets a boy named Oliver at the airport, and he happens to be on the next flight. They sit together and bond during the flight, but they are separated when the plane lands. This has been sitting on my shelf for years, so I decided to finally pick it up. I don't think that it was necessarily bad, but I don't think that it was anything memorable either. It was very predictable, a very quick read. I think that Oliver and Hadley were an okay couple. I think that they were cute and they had some good banter, but it wasn't anything that I was like kicking my feet squealing over. 
It was a very short read. I finished it in one sitting. I think that it was more a story of Hadley mending her strained relationship with her father and her new stepmother rather than a love story. I was also not the biggest fan of Hadley at all. I just think that she was very rude and mean to literally everybody but Oliver, which didn't really make a lot of sense to me. But she did have a bit of character development in the end, so I guess she ended up being an all right character. But it honestly wasn't much, so it was a little bit disappointing. I gave it a three out of five stars. It was meh. Next up, I read Only a Monster by Vanessa Len. This is another one I gave three out of five stars. This follows 16-year-old Joan, who discovers that her and her entire family are monsters with strange abilities. She also discovers that Nick, the cute boy from work that she has a crush on, is a legendary monster slayer. While on a date, Nick reveals his monster slaying abilities during an attack from a rival monster family, and it is quickly discovered that he will stop at nothing to eliminate Joan and her entire family in an attempt to stop the massacre, Joan teams up with Aaron, the youngest Oliver, in order to stop Nick once and for all. I think that the concept of this book was really intriguing. It started off okay, kind of lagged a bit in the middle, but then picked up a lot in the end, and that was when I was invested. It was a little bit confusing, and I think that the magic system was hard to follow at times. There are definitely some plot holes in this that don't really make a lot of sense, but if you kind of just ignore it and roll with it, you can still have a really fun time reading this. The best part about this book is probably that every monster family has different powers and abilities even within that family. I thought that was so cool. I will say that I was not a fan of the love triangle in this and the soulmates trope. I just don't think it really worked in this instance, so I ended up giving it a three out of five stars. The next book I read, which was probably one of my favorites of this month, is The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran. I gave this a five out of five stars. So this follows Dev, who is one of the producers of a reality TV show called Ever After. After. He is in charge of coaching the male participant in becoming better at his relationships. Dev's own love life has been a little bit complicated and a bit of a mess since his last breakup, but then walks in Dev's most complicated client yet. His name is Charlie, and he is a tech entrepreneur who has recently lost his job due to a little bit of an emotional breakdown at work, so he agrees to be a part of this show in the hopes of repairing his reputation. As Dev tries to help Charlie become more comfortable in front of the cameras and with the female contestants, they start to bond and grow closer, and they cannot deny their chemistry. I freaking love this book. I could not stop like squealing and kicking my feet while reading. These two are just so adorable. I absolutely love Charlie. I just wanted to hug him the entire time, which I know obviously with his touch aversion, you can't do that, but I really want to do. He's just so sweet. And then Dev was just so kind and intuitive to Charlie's every need, even from their very first meeting. These two were just so dang cute together, and I loved how their friendship grew into a romance as they started to trust one another. The chemistry that these two had were just off the charts. I loved how much they cared for one another, and watching them grow closer as the show progressed was just so, so cute. I just felt like their connection seemed very genuine. I think that they both grew a lot, not only together, but individually as well. The mental health discussions in this were just so well done. I think that they were so respectful and really were probably one of the best parts of this story. Charlie has OCD and anxiety and Dev has depression and I really appreciated how it never really felt like the love cures all trope. It was very real and raw. I just need more books like this and I'm pretty sure that there's going to be more in this series. I don't know if it's going to be following these two or it's going to be like a companion novel idea, but I am so freaking excited for it. Five out of five stars. Probably. Next up is The Sunset Crowd by Karen Tanaby, and I gave this 3.5 out of five stars. So this follows B. DuPont, who is an up-and-coming photographer in Hollywood during the 1970s. She becomes very good friends with Evra, who is a very popular clothing store owner. She reconnects her with Kai, who is an old friend turned movie producer. B is hoping to rekindle their friendship slash maybe relationship. But then Theodora Lee enters the scene and shakes everything up, bringing the worst out of everybody. This was a very, very slow-paced book. 
At times it definitely dragged and I did find myself being a little bit bored while reading. I wasn't truly invested in the story until the last couple of chapters. I think that it's a very character driven book and although I did think that these characters were interesting, I never really cared that much about what was happening to them. There was also a lot of characters that were just ultimately forgettable and didn't really bring anything to the story. I think that the most interesting part of the story was the friendship dynamics. I think that it was very interesting to see where things were going to end up and how Theodora was kind of rocking the boat. I did enjoy all of the drama and chaos that ensued because of Theodora and I think that that part was the most intriguing for me and that was what really kept me reading. None of the characters are particularly likable, but I loved to hate Theodora. I just couldn't stop reading about her and I really liked how we're kind of left off on a cliffhanger and we never truly know what happened which was very fun but yeah it was a little bit boring a little bit slow it was an average read i gave it 3.5 for the chaos and drama and then the final two books are part of the same series it is the grave maiden series by kelly coon the first is grave maidens the second is war maidens i gave both of these a 3.5 out of 5 stars three maidens are chosen to help guide the ruler of alu to the underworld this is viewed as a great honor but kamani sees it as nothing but a death sentence kamani's father is a great ruler and she has been learning under him for many years now but he is cast out when he is unable to save one of his royal patients but now the ruler is sick and Kamani's younger sister Nenea is chosen as one of the maidens so Kamani will stop at nothing to heal the ruler and stop her sister from having to perform her duties. When she arrives at the castle she discovers something far more sinister is occurring and it's her trying to put an end to it. Kamani was an interesting character. I think that she made some questions decisions and I hated the way that she treated her love interest Dagon. She did grow on me in the end and I do think that her character went through some good development but I can't say that I particularly liked her that much more by the end of it. I also thought Nanao was very annoying and it does come out why she's acting the way that she is acting but she just grinded my gears. The book starts off very slow and it did take me a while to become invested in the story but by the end of it I did want to know what was happening. It was quite obvious what was going to happen as it was very predictable but I did have a copy of the second book so I did continue on with the series which again I ended up giving a 3.5 to the War Maidens as well. I think that it was a fun conclusion that picks up very close to where the first book finishes. I liked how it all wrapped up in the end but it didn't quite make sense how we got to to that point, the plot and the decisions that the characters were making I felt weren't as thought out as the first book. A lot of the time it was just the characters bickering about the decision that they were going to have to make. Kamani doesn't seem to trust anybody in her group which causes her to make mistake after mistake which got kind of old very quickly. She did have quite a bit of character development in the end which I did like to see. Kamani grew a little bit more on me as the story progressed and her treatment of Dagon definitely improved in this one. She was at least trying to treat him nicely. I just think Dagon was one of the better characters in this book. He was just so sweet and caring towards Kamani, which I don't know why. I would have left her ass real quick. I also liked the boatman's character in this and his overall story was very intriguing. I kind of wish that there was more of him in this, to be honest. I think that he was one of the more interesting characters. I also think that the battle scenes were really well done. They were probably one of my favorite aspects of the story. Overall, I do think that the duology is worth a read. It was very fun and it did have some great action-packed moments. So I ended up giving the whole thing a 3.5 out of 5 overall. All right, everybody. So those were the last eight books that I read for the month of January 2024. If you're interested in part one where I talk about the first seven books that I read, then go check that out on my channel. Let me know down below if you have read any of these books and what you thought of them and I will see you all in my next video. Goodbye! Bye!